to introduce Ben Francis. I think many of us know Ben already. Um, he is a software engineer and founder of Kralion, uh, who and he has also founded the Webian and WebThings projects. And um, from the standardization point of view, he is also uh, an EY expert uh, in Web of Teams, but also in the web applications uh, groups, working groups. And he has previously worked for Mozilla and Google, and he is here to uh, talk about uh, how he has built um, smart building solutions uh, built on web things and web of things as an extension. So Ben, the floor is yours. Great. Hello everyone, thank you very much for having me. As you heard, I'm Ben Francis, founder of Krellian, who provides smart building solutions. I'm also the founder of the Web Things open source project, and I'm here today to talk about how I've used the Web of Things in commercial smart buildings. So I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about the business side of things to give you an idea of the kind of problems, kind of use cases that I'm trying to help businesses to solve. So businesses are wasting a lot of money on unutilized and inefficient buildings. 59% of businesses say that their office space requirements have reduced as a result of the pandemic. And meanwhile, energy prices tripled in the space of a year in the UK. So a lot of money is being wasted on rent and energy bills for spaces which aren't being fully utilised. If businesses meet the UK government's energy efficiency targets for 2030, they stand to save £6 billion a year. So there's some serious potential energy savings. But I've spoken to facilities managers at lots of medium-sized businesses who say they've been given top-down net zero targets to meet and they just don't know where to start. They manage buildings with multiple complex building management systems that don't talk to each other, which makes it very hard to get an overall picture of how a building is being used. So Krellian will provide a smart building hub, which consolidates multi-vendor building management systems into a single standardized interface using the Web of Things. Data from that hub will then be streamed to a cloud service to create a digital twin of a building to model how it's being used and identify potential optimizations. So this solution helps facilities managers to meet their net zero targets while saving money by optimizing space utilization and reducing energy consumption. That's the business pitch bit over. So last year I was involved in a project funded by Innovate UK. We run a, won a grant. Um, so Innovate UK is the UK's national innovation agency. And the project was to create a minimum viable product of the Krellian cloud service to provide real-time data analytics for smart buildings. And as part of that project, I worked on bringing the existing WebThings gateway software into line with the latest W3C Watt standards. So first of all, let's talk a bit about WebThings. So WebThings is an open source implementation of the Web of Things. I started it at uh, Mozilla, where it was incubated for about four years before being spun out as an independent open source project. And that project is now sponsored by Krellian, my company. There are two main components to WebThings. There's WebThings Gateway, which was originally designed as a smart building hub for DIY smart homes. And then there's WebThings Framework, which is a collection of software libraries, essentially what producer implementations in about a dozen different programming languages. So this was the um, this is the WebThings Gateway web interface. So WebThings Gateway bridges a range of different smart home protocols to the Web of Things and provides you with this unified uh, web interface to control all your devices, regardless of which underlying protocol or technology they use. If you click on a device, you can read and write properties, you can invoke actions, you can view a log of events. There's also a drag and drop rules engine. So you can create if this, then that style rules to automate your home. And there's a floor plan feature where you can arrange devices on a floor plan of your home for at a glance monitoring and control. Now this is designed for homes. And so we wanted to apply it to commercial buildings, which may be a seven story office block. And so this doesn't really work for that. You can't zoom in or pan around. You have multiple floors. There's also a basic logging feature for logging sensor data on the gateway itself. Um, so this works really well in the context of a smart home where you're logging some basic data. Um, but again, it doesn't scale very well to larger commercial buildings, especially if you're running it on a Raspberry Pi with an SD card, because you're soon going to wear out the SD card with so many writes. 
And the gateway has this extensible add-on space system where you can add support for different types of um, smart home protocols and uh, technologies like ZigBee, Z-Wave, HomeKit, but also vendor specific things like Philips Hue. So we wanted to try and adapt this for use in commercial buildings using uh, to support commercial building management systems. This is the uh, basic architecture of WebThings Gateway. So the front end is a web application written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It communicates with the back end using HTTP and WebSockets. The back end is written in TypeScript. And then you have individual adapter add-ons, which each run in their own process and communicate with the back end using an internal WebSocket-based IPC mechanism. And the add-ons themselves can be written in different languages like Node.js, Python, and Rust. So part of the Innovate UK project was to bring the gateway, first of all, in line with W3C Watt standards, because up until this point, it just implemented Mozilla's legacy web thing API, which um, predated these standards. So after the project, the gateway is now a thing description 1.1 producer. And it's also a producer for two of the profiles defined in the what profile specification, the HTTP basic profile and the HTTP SSE profile. So that's the gateway. So now let's talk about Corellian Cloud. So this was a brand new service um, as a result of the Innovate UK project. Corellian Cloud provides real-time data analytics for buildings to model how they're being used and identify potential optimizations. It's currently in a closed alpha, but if you want to request an invite code to try it out, you can go to corellian.com slash cloud. So this is the basic architecture of Corellian Cloud and how it relates to WebThings Gateway. It's a cloud service hosted on AWS using EC2 instances backed by Elastic Block Storage and Elastic IP addresses. The front end, again, is a web application written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which communicates with the back end using HTTP and WebSockets, the same as the gateway, and the back end is written in Node.js. So the cloud service listens to sensor data coming from the gateway on premises in buildings. So you can listen to multiple buildings, stream all the data to the cloud, and then store it in a database. And for the database, I chose MongoDB for a couple of reasons. Um, but the main one being that I could use the same database as an object store for storing structured metadata like thing descriptions, but also as a time series database using the relatively new time series collections feature of MongoDB, which is a much more efficient way of storing large volumes of time series data. And it provides a more sophisticated mechanism for querying um, uh, time series data for doing analytics. So this is the user interface of Krellian Cloud. You can sign up, you can log in, and then you go to this devices screen where to add a device, you click the big green plus button and you add a device by entering its web thing URL. And what I mean by that is the URL of its thing description. When you click next, it will try and prefetch the thing description. And if it finds that that thing description requires authentication, uh, then it will prompt you for credentials. This is what's known as security bootstrapping in the what discovery specification. Now, what this was meant to do was to use OAuth2 um, to redirect to the user interface, the web interface of the gateway and have the user authenticate using their username and password and then automatically be uh, issued a token, which would then be, could then be refreshed later on. It turns out that WebThings Gateway doesn't implement OAuth2 as fully as I thought it did, and so this wasn't possible. Um, so for the time being, it just prompts you to manually enter a token, which isn't very user-friendly because you essentially have to use developer tools to get hold of that token on the back end. Um, so that's something that's going to have to be added later and um, full OAuth2 support. So once you added your credentials, it has another go at prefetching the thing description and passes some basic metadata like the title of the thing to make sure you're adding the thing that you think you're adding. Then once you've added a bunch of devices, they're all listed on a dashboard like this. And if you click on a device, you can view its properties. 
So currently, these are just the basic JSON types of string, number, and Boolean, and it's read only. It's not doing anything yet fancy with semantic annotations like the gateway does to provide a more sophisticated user interface, and you can't write properties yet. It's just about reading them. So once you've added your devices, you can then add your building, a representation of your building. To add a building, you give it a name. You say how many floors the building has, and you give each floor a name. And then once you've added the building, it goes onto this dashboard. So you can, you can actually um, monitor multiple buildings from this web interface. So if you're a facilities manager that has a um, portfolio of real estate, you can monitor multiple buildings from the same application. When you click on a building, you go to this view, which is a kind of Google Map style view where you can pan and zoom and you can switch floor. You can upload a floor plan for each floor. So this is the floor plan of the Urban Sciences Building at Newcastle University, who we were working with. Once you've added a floor plan, you can add devices to that floor. So you pick one of the devices you already added to the dashboard, and then it gets represented as this blue pin, which you can drag and drop around to place it at the point where the device exists in the real world. So once you've added a bunch of devices, you have something that looks like this. It's, uh, so you, you've got the location data now to go with the sensor data to help with visualization later on. So once you've added the devices and the buildings, then you can start adding analytics. So you add a metric, you give it a name, you say which device you want to log data from, and you pick the property of the device that you want to log, and then you pick a retention period. And so this is using uh, features of MongoDB on the back end, uh, which will automatically expire data over time in a much more efficient way. So once you've added metric, you click on the metric, and over time, you'll see this just line, line graph of the sensor data over time. So again, this is a minimum viable product. This is the simplest possible visualization we could start with. So it's logging data. So Krellian Cloud is acting as a Things Description 1.1 consumer. It's also an implementation of a Things Description directory from the What Discovery specification. And it's acting as a consumer of the HTTP basic profile to read properties and the HTTP SSE profile to observe properties, which causes some issues, which I'm going to discuss in a moment. So lessons learned and next steps. Um, I tried to write a list of things that I'd learned building this, and it got very long. There were about 10 or 15 things I really wanted to talk about. Don't have time to talk about them all. So I'm going to talk about my top five. So number one is starting on a positive note. The Web of Things is an extremely powerful tool for consolidating multi-vendor building management systems into a standardized interface that can be consumed by web services. This is a very simple and powerful idea of giving physical devices in the real world URLs on the web using some basic standardized metadata and then getting sensor data in a standardized format that can be consumed by web services, which can lead to a whole ecosystem of web services to help monitor, control, and optimize buildings. So this is really exciting. Lesson number two, however, is that neither SSE, service and events, nor webhooks scaled well enough for this use case. I want to dig into that a bit more. So I'm one of the editors of the profile specification, and we spent a lot of time debating which eventing mechanism to use for the HTTP profile, because HTTP um, 1.0, at least, doesn't have its own push mechanism. But you can do push, i.e. pushing data from the server to the client, by using various approaches that extend the HTTP protocol. One of those is webhooks. Now, webhooks is not really a standard. It's just a design pattern. And the way that it works is essentially by reversing the client server roles. So when you subscribe to an event, you tell um, the entity, the, the thing in this case, that every time something changes, every time there's an event or a property changes, I want you to send me an HTTP request. Now, that's the other way around to what um, a thing and a consumer would usually work with the HTTP basic profile where the thing is a server and the consumer is a client. So that means that if you want to use the full set of operations, 
uh, your thing has to be both an HTTP client and an HTTP server, which conversely means that the consumer has to be an HTTP server and an HTTP client, which isn't too bad in, in the case of a cloud service like Krillian Cloud, because you can do that. But in some deployment scenarios, like if your consumer is a mobile application, native mobile application, uh, that's a bit of a problem because if you want the consumer to be an HTTP server that's always accessible, um, it's going to drop offline a lot of the time and you have to tunnel through firewalls and all kinds of things. So it doesn't work for all deployment scenarios. The other thing about webhooks is that every event is a separate HTTP request, um, which means a separate TCP socket. And there's no built-in rate limiting mechanism for webhooks, at least not in the current webhook profile, which means that if you're not careful, you can very easily accidentally launch a distributed denial of service attack at your own service. If I tell hundreds of devices to send me hundreds of sensor readings a second, I'm very quickly going to overwhelm my own service. So the conclusion is that webhooks is um, good for listening to low frequency events from a large number of devices. The other approach we looked at was service sent events. And these are the the, the two separate profiles we ended up with, um, webhooks and service end events. So service end events is an existing W3C and what WG standard. It's an upgraded HTTP connection. So you send an HTTP request, and then it gets um, kept open. And then from that point on, it's a unidirectional communication mechanism from the server to the client. So the server can keep pushing events down to the client whenever something changes. Now, the downside of this approach is it requires keeping a separate TCP socket open for each affordance. The way the HTTP SSE profile works is to have a URL endpoint for each interaction affordance, which means that if you want to listen to um, hundreds of sensors in a building, generating potentially hundreds of readings a second, um, you have a very large number of TCP sockets that have got to be kept open simultaneously. And it turns out there are upper limits to this. So if you're, if you're trying to do this um, in client-side JavaScript, there's actually a very low limit if you're using um, HTTP 1 of how many simultaneous SS, SSE connections you can have open at a time. And it's six, six connections per domain. Um, if you're doing HTTP 2, the, the limit's a bit higher. But that's not how Krillian Cloud works. Krillian Cloud does it on the back end using an, an event source library in Node.js. But even on the back end, there's an upper limit. So in a Linux-based operating system, there's an upper limit to the number of outgoing TCP sockets you can have open at any one time. By default, in most Linux distros, it's about 470. If you reconfigure the kernel, you can get that up to about 1,500. But there's still a, an upper limit. And if, you're, if we're talking about hundreds of devices in a building and multiple buildings, you're pretty quickly going to hit that limit. And what that means is you're going to have to scale the cloud service horizontally. You're going to need multiple nodes in the cluster just to keep all these TCP sockets open. So that's not great either. So service and events, good for listening to very high frequency events from a small number of devices. Because once the connection is open, it actually is very efficient at sending lots of events. But neither of these solutions scales well for a high frequency events from a large number of devices, which is really what we're trying to do here. Enter WebSockets. So WebSockets is an existing W3C and what WG standard. It is bi-directional. So it's, it's an upgraded HTTP connection like service sent events. But once it's open, it can be used for all operation types, not just observing properties and subscribing to events. You can read and write properties, invoke and query actions. You can do everything. You can also share a single TCP connection or a WebSocket connection between multiple affordances of a thing and even between multiple things. But you have to define your own sub protocol because a WebSocket is essentially just a raw TCP socket with no semantics attached to it. You have to define your own protocol in order to use it. There are arguably also refinements needed to thing descriptions in order to use WebSockets effectively. Um, because in a thing description, you have to provide a separate URL endpoint for each affordance, and consumers aren't generally smart enough to know to reuse that same um, endpoint, and especially to how to know when to reuse an existing connection rather than opening a new one. So you can kind of work around this by defining those things in a sub protocol. But um, there's some work planned for the next charter period to try and be able to describe this kind of persistent connection in a better way in a thing description. 
So a while back, I created this uh, community group at the W3C called the Web Thing Protocol Community Group with the aim of defining a common protocol for communicating with connected devices over the web. And specifically, one of the deliverables was creating a WebSocket sub-protocol. Uh, fairly recently, I submitted a strawman proposal for a WebSocket sub-protocol, which covers the full set of operations in the Web of Things and allows you to share the same WebSocket between multiple affordances of the same thing and even between multiple things. So if you'd like to find out more about that, you search for WebThing Protocol Community Group. I'd love to get your feedback and also try and get people to implement the, the um, WebSocket sub-protocol. Lesson number three. So there's no way to automatically keep a thing description in a thing description directory in sync with its original source. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. If you're trying to add a thing description to a directory from a URL, you essentially have to download the thing description and then re-upload it to the directory. But there's no record when you register it in the directory of the original URL you got it from, which means that if the original thing description hosted either by where a thing is hosting its own thing description or perhaps another directory like a gateway is hosting it, if the original thing description changes, there's no way to know that it's changed to update the directory. There are expires and TTL members in the registration metadata in a directory, but it wasn't clear to me exactly what should happen once the TD expires. I'm not really sure what the solution to this is, but I think there could be um, more work done on, on keeping a directory in sync when there's an original source of a thing description. Lesson number four. So I had this um, really basic use case of a directory where I, for analytical uh, analytics purposes, where I wanted to say, give me a list of all the devices in a building that have a temperature sensor. And the way um, that WebThings Gateway marks this up is using semantic annotations. So in the apps type member of a thing description, there's an array and, and I can put a, a say temperature sensor. But you can't really query that using JSON path. So JSON path is one of the ways of um, searching a directory. There are a couple of other options, Sparkle and XPath, uh, but I wanted to use JSON path because I'm using JSON data. Um, but there are a couple of limitations. So there's, there's no, there are no standardized filter options. So you can't filter by the presence of a value in an array, as, at least not in a standardized way. There are, there are kind of implementation specific ways of doing this. And there's also no JSON-LD support. And by that, I mean expand, automatically expanding prefixes from compact URIs. So that means it's very difficult to filter results by semantic annotations. I think there's some work planned in the next charter period for um, alternative approaches to search. OK, number five, finally. Profiles and binding templates could work better together. Now, I'm not going to talk about this in a lot of depth because this is a huge topic. And I recently um, presented a couple of straw man proposals to the Web of Things working group, with some ideas about a different approach to profiles in 2.0. But essentially, there are um, profiles and binding templates provide two separate ways of providing protocol bindings in the Web of Things that sometimes conflict with each other. And the protocol bindings to find in profiles kind of go beyond what's possible currently to describe in a thing description, which is a bit of a problem. Things like asynchronous action queues is a well-known example. And so I have this proposal of um, profiles which use a default protocol binding from a binding template document. But if you'd like to know more about that, um, head over to the Web of Things working group public mailing list where you can find all the links. So next steps. On the gateway side, um, full OAuth 2 implementation, which I thought was already there. Uh, there are a bunch of things that the gateway already does, but in a non-standard way. So it provides a directory of things, but not using the directory service API. And it does DNS, uh, MDNS-based discovery. Um, but they need bringing into line with the new W3C standards. Similarly, um, the gateway provides a WebSocket sub-protocol, but I'd like to implement the, the new one from the community group that's being worked on. And there are various standards compliance products as well. But the thing I'm most excited about is a produ production quality distribution of WebThings Gateway built on Ubuntu Core. So I've just applied for some funding for a collaboration with Canonical to build a version of WebThings Gateway packaged in a, a 
containerized in a SNAP package with a strict security confinement model, and then bundling that SNAP package with a custom OS image built on Ubuntu Core. And what that will enable, apart from better security, is automatic transactional over-the-air updates for both the Gateway app and the underlying OS, because the Gateway is currently distributed either as a Docker image or as a Raspberry Pi OS-based image where we can't update the underlying OS. And we're starting to hit problems where we can't update the Gateway application because the OS is too old and doesn't support what we need. On the cloud side, again, a Wolf 2 implementation, I would like it to be a directory service API consumer so that you can add a whole building worth of devices in one go rather than doing them one at a time, which is very laborious. Also implement the WebSocket sub protocol when it's ready. Much richer data visualizations, so um, heat maps which display uh, the change of occupancy and energy usage over time in a very visual way, and a richer user interface for things which now lets you control as well as monitor devices, and eventually use machine learning to automatically identify potential optimizations. Another thing I wanted to mention is Krillian Hub which when it is released will be a first of its kind commercial Web of Things gateway product, which is an actual physical hardware product you can buy off the shelf. If you'd like to register your interest in that, go to krillian.com slash hub. And finally, I just wanted to mention that Krillian does provide a consulting service, Web of Things consulting service. As the UK's leading experts in the Web of Things, Krillian can help you understand the latest W3C Watt standards and implement them in your project, product, or service. So if you want some help building a Web Thing, Thing Directory, or Watt Consumer, or you just want to know how W3C Watt standards um, might help uh, your organization, then please do get in touch with me. And that's it. I will stop talking and uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you very much.